Welcome back to the OIS Podcast. This week, Dr. Sadri conducted his first interview over Zoom with friend and colleague, Dr. John Hovanesian. Feel free to watch this and future episodes on the OIS Ophthalmology Innovation and Investment YouTube channel. Good morning. My name is Dr. Hassan Sadri, board certified ophthalmologist here from actually my home in Southern California, not very far from my next guest, who is a friend, a brother, and a fellow Wolverine, which I have to tell you that I'm very proud of. We both went to medical school there. John lives here very close to us in Southern Cal, and he's got a tremendous practice called Harvard Eye. And I'm just super excited and delighted to have him on OIS podcast. John, how you doing? I'm great. It's good to see you, Hassan, during these weird times as we're starting to get our practices back and going again. You look terrific. You look really good. You look like you got a tan. <laughs> it's just uh, dark in here, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, your, uh, your, your background's beautiful. That looks like it should be a virtual background, but that's, uh, that's, that's home for you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's funny. We're, we, I like cypress trees, so I put some in the back. But, um, I'm with you. I'll, yeah, I follow you on Zoom, on your Zoom um, podcast, which is amazing. And then you've done so much, so much work. There's a lot of we want to talk about. Most people know you, um, but for those who, that don't, I want them to really get an understanding about your background. I know, you know, for, for those of you who don't know John, he trained at uh, University of Michigan Medical School. Go Blue. Um, and he actually stayed in Detroit. Uh, and did his residency, and then ultimately came to Jules Stein, did a two-year refractive cataract cornea fellowship, and then joined Harvard Eye in 1999, his uh, senior partner, now retired, uh, Dr. Ohanisian, who's just an unbelievable person as well. Um, we're just so delighted to have you on. John, tell us a little bit about, about your background. When you were growing up, was your dad an ophthalmologist? What, why medicine? Why ophthalmology? Yeah, so I, th thanks for asking. You know, I, I, as long as I could remember in childhood, I remembered wanting to be a doctor, and uh, I carried that right into med school. From the time I was a little kid, I thought I would be a heart surgeon doing uh, heart transplants. Uh, and then I got into med school and uh, got in the operating room in a vascular surgery rotation and found that uh, it really wasn't such a pleasant environment. Uh, patients would die on the table and you'd be, you know, standing for 16 hours of surgery and, and realize that, you know, this patient's not going to do very well because most of them are sick. Um, and then I, I, I did a rotation in ophthalmology. Uh, and discovered a world I didn't know existed. First of all, we sit down when we operate. Uh, this is huge. Uh, <laughs> and, and second, our procedures are short and very, very gratifying for patients. Uh, there's no question when you go to work each day as an ophthalmologist, whether you did something valuable for the world that day. Uh, every day, people are grateful for, for what we give them. And so uh, that has always motivated me and continues to motivate me to serve patients today. Well, you have so much going on in your life, both personally and professionally. Uh, you and I are involved in so many different things, but you know, one of the things I really enjoy about you is you have a nice balance. You, you know, you're, you serve uh, your community, you're involved in your church, you still teach, you teach Sunday school. So are you still doing that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so my, my kids are there and we, we have a program for older uh, kids in Sunday school that we do that is uh, kind of teaching them about important lessons of life. And it's, uh, it's been fun to see. That's, that's just terrific. I mean, you know, I think part of my passion of doing these uh, is, is really to understand how to live a balanced life and how to go for it. Right. And I think you're, you're walking that talk and, you know, the other thing that people don't know about you, you're, you know, you're heavily involved in the Boy Scouts of America. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so the Scouts are uh, an organization that's been around for almost 110 years. And uh, despite all the media attention about events that happened, um, you know, uh, years and years ago uh, that have, have put the organization back uh, in the spotlight in a negative way, what you don't hear in the news is all the incredible stories of kids who become leaders in the world in the future and they were influenced by their time in Scouts. And now uh, we have girls in the program that was traditionally Boy Scouts. And that's great because in the past, it was always a, a double standard. Boys could become Eagle Scouts. They could have that, that name, but girls had 
Girl Scouting, which is a terrific program, fantastic program, but it didn't offer them that that uh, credential that they could put on their resume. And a lot of girls want the outdoor adventure stuff that uh, only the traditional Boy Scout program offered. So I've got a 14 year old daughter and she is well on her way now to becoming an Eagle Scout. Uh, two sons who are doing the same one already is. And it's just exciting to see what kids can become when they're given the right set of rules to follow and uh, you know, an environment where they can learn to lead. So that's for me what makes scouting exciting. Yeah, so so that's that's fascinating because I think you're teaching um, your legacy, but also beyond that, you're creating a formula for success, which is I think pretty critical. Yeah, uh, you know, in, in this world of instant gratification, right? Everyone's on Insta this, Insta that. Um, even your groceries show up to your house uh, without you going to it now. Um, in yeah. the world that we live in, they live in, really. It's unfair for us, our generation, to expect anything else because that's all they know. And it's yeah. great that we have that structure for them to follow. Yeah, it's true. You know, it's, uh, there are a lot of shortcuts in life right now, but uh, building people of good character and building future leaders, uh, that is a legacy that's going to long live well past us. And it's not something that there are a lot of shortcuts for. You know, you have to start with good principles and give good examples. Uh, and then it's incredible what young people can become. So, yeah, that's. That's very gratifying. And I know you do the same with your kids. You're kind. You're kind. You're, we try. I mean, you know, it's, it's hard. It's challenging. Uh, we're fighting YouTube a lot <laughs> and, and Minecraft and pot, whatever the new video games are. And you know what? At the end of the day, there was Nintendo when we were growing up. So I can't really, you know, <laughs> I can't say that we weren't playing video games. Well, there was. But, and every know, generation has looked on the one behind it and said, uh, these guys will never be <laughs> what we were. But in fact, somehow the world keeps moving forward. Keeps moving There's forward. There's been yeah. a lot of false gods, haven't there? And so <laughs> we have to sort of recognize what's really important and teach our kids that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's the universal principles. So let's talk about, let's pivot a little bit, John. I, you, you know, most of you, most know John as someone who's really approachable, a very good thought leader. His passions, obviously, cataract, cataract refractive surgery and pterygium, but he's got a wealth of other things he's involved with. What are you working on right now? I know you and I talked about your company uh, and your founder of MD Backline. And I think that for folks that don't know um, about you and your company. How did this um, concept originate and what was the why? And then tell us through the journey about how you actually made it happen. Yeah, you know, early in my career, I discovered that the one uh, thing that was going to become more valuable to me than money is time. And that we physicians have such limited time to do so many things. You know, we live, our, it, ophthalmologists in particular, we're the ultimate 10 minute problem solvers, right? We have this window of time of 10 minutes or less with each patient mm -hmm. to figure out what their problem is, uh, establish trust, uh, you know, come up with a solution, examine them, document it, bill it, do all the things we do, and then have them hopefully leave with a positive experience. And it's incredible that we learn to be able to do that time after time after time throughout the day. But we really don't have the time we need to properly communicate with patients. And there are a lot of symptoms of that that uh, are problems. One of the biggest is uh, the lack of adoption of premium lenses in the US. So let's think about it, you know, cataract surgery, it's a procedure we all know where we replace the lens of the eye because it becomes cloudy. And nowadays we have choices of lens implants where uh, we can virtually eliminate eyeglasses for the vast majority of our patients going through the surgery. Uh, it doesn't take any additional surgery. It doesn't take any meaningful additional risk. There is cost that's out of pocket, but it's kind of a no brainer because for the rest of their life, they get that benefit, don't they? So if you think about it, you would think the majority of patients would want premium lens implants. And in fact, market research studies show that about 80% of patients do want them if they understood them. But why is it that only 11% of patients in the U.S. actually receive them? Well, we think there are a number of problems, but the biggest one is a lack of time to communicate what they are to patients. And that's where MD Backline comes in. So MD Backline is a um, web-based system that automates communication with patients before and after office visits about common conditions. Uh, and it's not a chat bot like Alexa, it's more a structured question and answer 
with delivery of, of educational material that goes to a patient. So a, a typical use case, let's say in a cataract patient, most cataract patients come to your office either having been referred by their optometrist or primary care doctor, or maybe they were being followed by the practice. What the system does is it detects um, the, the patient's upcoming visit and that the patient probably has cataract from the information in their records. And it will contact them by text message and email to say, hey, uh, this is Dr. Saudry, and I uh, want to ask you some questions and share some information for you, uh, with you for, about your upcoming visit. Uh, the patient can then answer some simple questions about uh, their history and their visual desires, and then view some information about cataract surgery to take the scary part out of it, and also um, help them learn about the concept of uh, refractive lens implants, including uh, getting an idea that there is cost involved. So patients come to the office not afraid of cataract surgery and aware of the idea that they have these implants uh, that are available to them. So it's a much more productive conversation during that short window of time that, that you or your staff has when you're with the patient in the office. Mm -hmm. um, and this has been used in a number of practices across the country, small and large. And what we've seen is just the functionality that I just described, that alone, um, increases the adoption of premium lenses from two to threefold. So a practice that's doing, you know, 5% is now doing 15 or 20%. Uh, a practice that's doing, you know, 20% is, is doing significantly more. And of course, in practices that are doing very well with premium lens implants, it's probably because they are already communicating well. So you only see so much improvement, but there's improvement. It's real and it's um, uh, a high benefit both to the patient who gets to live a better life and to the practice who gets to deliver, you know, services at their highest level. So, um, and that's cataract surgery. It then the patient, once they go through cataract surgery, it follows them afterwards to make sure that they receive the result that they expected. Uh, for those patients who are not happy, and that's maybe one in 10, um, we need to do something more. Our job's not done, right? We know those patients need management of their dry eye or a YAG laser or refractive enhancement or something. For those patients who are happy, well, we're, we're done at that point and we invite them to go to the online review sites like Google or uh, Health Grades or Yelp to say positive things about their experience. And they do. And so we see an increase in online reviews for the practices that are using the system as well. So that, that's great. I mean, I, I think anytime, you know, you have shared information for the patient on their time uh, and the doctor can just sort of trim the information when they come in, they're aware consumer, to your point, uh, not only makes a better experience for the consumer, but also just better expectations. Because now they're, to your point, you, you know, I think the bigger, we have different problems with the high conversion practices because, Sometimes, uh, like you said, the patient comes in and the practice does such a good job of converting that patient, but then the expectation gap is there, right? So it's yeah. really, really critical that uh, they understand that. And I think 97%, as you know, of verbal communication is actually lost. People don't remember it. I mean, they, they think they remember it. We think we've articulated, but when they go home, they have no idea how many times we've seen a patient where we've done surgery on and we tell them, look, there's a chance you're going to wear some glasses here and there. And they're like, no, wait a minute. You said I'm never going to wear glasses again. And I said, I've never said that. And, you know, and th that's a problem I think that you're trying to tackle. And I think for, for client converters, that, that's, that's great. And I think it's interesting, isn't this COVID thing? Tell me about COVID and how's that sort of changed your life personally, but also sure. how are you adapting in, in the practice? You and I talked, uh, Right in the beginning of it, uh, we had a Zoom call like this alone, and I'd like to know how that's evolved. Yeah, I, I, let's do that. Let me just answer one other thing related to what you just said about the conversation with patients uh, about premium lenses. And of course, we have conversations about dry eye and glaucoma and a variety of other conditions sure. as well, but premium lenses is an important area. And one of the important things, I think, is that the conversation with the patient is not the same for every patient, right? To be effective for both the doctor or staff, and some doctors want to have the conversation, sometimes they want to relegate it to the staff. It's possible either way. We give uh, a report, a single page, a PDF type uh, report that doctors can view and their staff can view that tells um, how likely the patient is to want to upgrade because the time you invest depends upon how 
uh, fertile the soil is, uh, if you excuse the expression, is uh, you know is the patient receptive <laughs> yep. to the uh, to the conversation, and if we know that in advance, and now we do, yeah. uh, and we also know from this report what are the likely stumbling blocks, what are the possible technologies that would fit based on the patient's visual desires, uh, how likely they are to upgrade, and then you know what kinds of parts of that conversation should you be most concerned about. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like where are the landmines before I start with the patient. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, yeah, so, you know, COVID has been such an interesting challenge for us, hasn't it, in our careers? Uh, I don't know about you, but never have, have I or my practice faced anything remotely as challenging. Uh, and yet, you know, it calls upon the same values that we have as individuals, as physicians, as business leaders that we've always needed to have. Uh, it's just tested us in new ways, hasn't it? Uh, we have to be both smart as business people, but also principled. And uh, like everybody, we went through a shutdown period where we were just seeing a few emergencies and are now starting to open back up. And it's gratifying to see patients are coming back. But uh, we're not fully uh, there now as we record this in late June. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's still building at this point. Um, yes. We also recognized at MD Backline that there were unique needs for practices because of the uh, shutdown. We don't want patients sitting in the lobby with a clipboard anymore. We want to move them through the office quickly to do their exam and then get back on their way. And so because we had developed this system that communicates with patients, it's actually pretty easy to build uh, a way for, for us to collect the entire medical history, uh, including demographics, insurance information, uh, sharing forms like HIPAA and financial policy forms and getting acknowledgement on those for us to build that so that patients can basically walk into the practice having all that history collected so they can come in and have their vision pressure refraction if needed and any other technical testing and then see the doctor. Uh, so you shortcut a lot of the time, uh, almost half of the time that many new patients would spend in the practice. And so that's something that we, we are offering with MD Backline now and, and in the future because there seems to be a need for it. I mean, that's great. Time. Time is the biggest uh, challenge. So COVID has changed everything because I think, to your point, patients are less probably, some, some patients we argue less likely want to come in right now, especially in this yeah. environment where we're at. They're saying the cases are increasing because now people are out and shopping and go to dinners and stuff. Um, but that's also created a unique, in my uh, opinion, a, a unique opportunity because we're doing a lot more of this with the patients, telemedicine. So your 80-year-old pseudophagic patient who's stable on glaucoma on one medication that would, like to your point, come with a clipboard, wait an hour, you know, uh, in the average office. And, and uh, you know, then you come in there for a five, six-minute exam is no longer, in my opinion, necessary. Right? What are... What are, you, what are your thoughts about what's gonna, how is this going to evolve? Is this going to stay with us? Are we going to see a sort of a snap back to where we were? Is it going to be a hybrid? What are your thoughts on how we see patients? Yeah, it's a, it, this is a really great question. And of course, we don't know the future, but there are some big trends that um, are going to be accelerated, I think, by this. Um, so one is the um, monitoring of patients remotely. There really never was a, a, a great uh, system, an economic system to support that. You know, so if a patient could measure their intraocular pressure at home, how does the doctor account for the time that they take to review that, review the history, put it all together, counsel the patient? You know, so now there's a value system for it, but uh, even though we don't have the at-home IOP testing in a, you know, fully accepted way yet, mm -hmm. but um, but it still doesn't pay like in the office care does. So we have a growing number of patients uh, but we don't have time to take care of all of them and doing it remotely doesn't really economically work that well. Probably I think what we're going to evolve to is systems where we can categorize patients by, do they really need to come in? You know, let's redefine how often does a glaucoma patient need to come in? Is it really every three months or six months? Or are there certain variables we could look at that predict success where we can make it once a year? And it might be controversial to say that, but in a variety of conditions, we probably can stretch out the episodes of care so that when they do come in, it's likely to be you know, beneficial and not just a routine check. So that's one trend I think we'll see. And then the other is that in our offices themselves, we're gonna to start to be very sensitive to our time as a, um, you know, a commodity that we can't waste. 
uh, we're going to find ways to move patients through both efficiently and to save you know, the time of the most expensive resource, the doctor, um, to concentrate on just those activities that only we can do. And that'll be done through probably a variety of technologies as well as processes. You know, the enemy of innovation is high margins, right? In traditional practice of medicine, at least in ophthalmology, there were reasonably high margins. And so we can be sloppy around a lot of processes in our practice about, around how we spent both time and money. Well, that's going away now. And so we have to think smarter and find better uses of our time mm -hmm. um, or better ways to take care of time consuming, low value activities. So let's talk about that. So technologies, innovation, you and I are involved in a lot of ventures to the, to, together. Uh, obviously, Visionary Ventures is one of them. Um, yep. What are your, so if you were to give us some insight on what you're involved with, because the other challenge for me, and you said we did time, is like you have family time, you got you know, all your venture stuff, and you got your practice, you got to see patients and keep the lights on. The question is, how do you divide that time? We'll get to that second, but I really want to get to know a little bit of what the top, I would say five, and not because of any value add or to, to you only. What are some of the things you're excited about um, coming down that you're involved with? Um, is, it, is it cataract? Is it pterygium? Is it dry eye? Um, and also, what do you think in the next five years, let's say three to five years, how is that going to morph into, given the demand that we're going to be seeing with all the boomers coming up? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm excited and a little daunted by the uh, the amount of you know volume that there is, uh, and a little concerned about the economics of that because the crunch is always being put on doctors to 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 deliver more in less time. So it seems to me that all of those factors point toward more adoption of premium cataract technologies, right? Cataract surgery is going to remain, all the statistics say, the, the cornerstone of our practice, and our technology keeps getting better. Um, the things I've been excited about, you know, the panoptics lens it has just been transformative for a lot of practice, practices because we, we do a lot of outcomes. We use MD backline to find out what patients actually can do after surgery. And we've followed since the earliest premium lens days what, what true spectacle independence was like, how many patients actually don't wear any glasses for anything. And that number was kind of lackluster for a long time. It was in the hovering in the mid 30s percent. So like 35, 36%, regardless of what multifocals or accommodating lenses we had. With panoptics, it jumped up to 83%. Um, so that's 83% of patients wear no glasses for anything. And that's incredible. Uh, that is, clearly a, a departure and a, a good reason we should be doing more uh, premium lenses. But of course, it is a multifocal and it's not for everyone. Uh, patients glare and halos were, uh, were similar to previous multifocals. It's interesting because with that particular lens, we don't think of glare and halos as being as much of a problem as with premium, uh, previous multifocals. But in fact, turns out um, they are. It's just that patients seem to be so happy with their spectacle independence that they don't complain about it. And so there are other lenses that are exciting too. The Vividi from uh, Alcon, and I hate to just talk about Alcon's products. In fact, the, uh, the um, Symphony Plus is likely to improve significantly on glare and halos. Uh, there's a company called Cord, uh, C-O-R-D, that has a lens called the SC9, not yet FDA approved. This is a terrific uh, extended depth of focus lens that um, is built on sort of the, the infrastructure that the crystal lens was, but it has many significant design improvements that will um, that give it same great founder, Same founder, right? Stuart Cummings, right? Yeah, Stuart, that's right. Stuart Cummings and Lynn Archer are the principals in that company who uh, we've had a chance to use that lens in clinical trials with really good results. And I think we'll see more and more um, of these promising technologies. What do you think about the LAL, uh, Asan? I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on that. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it's, so full disclosure, uh, we're, um, we're investors passively in the, in the company. But I think that, um, to your point, when you're spilling light, if Mother Nature thought that was a great idea, we would have multifocals in, in mammals' eyes. But I think to your description, uh, an accommodative platform, or at least one that's a monofocal, pseudo-accommodative platform that actually can adjust, I think ultimately independent of any manipulation, ultimately. Right now, I love 
what uh, Andy and Eric and Ron are doing with, uh, with RX site. I think it's great technology, you know, not for everybody. I think it's going to be for a subset of really good, strong uh, folks like you who can actually convert and deliver. Um, but I love, love the flat that they've actually eliminated that problem. And also this with top but also um, in my opinion, it really enabled us finally to get a quantitative outcome. I mean, the biggest yes. frustration for me has always been forget about post refractive patients, but like patients who come in and you're like off and you're like, you know, <laughs> what, what happened? I did the aura, I did this, I yeah. did that. And you're just humbled, you know, by yeah. just yeah. nature. And I think they've, they've really gone after that. And I think that's critical. Well, it only makes sense, doesn't it? Uh, you know, so the light adjustable lens is uh, designed to take all of that uh, drama that we have with intraoperative aberrometry and controlling dry eye before surgery and trying to get good measurements and to put it after surgery to, yeah. uh, to allow us to, to back end the, the refinement of the uh, outcome so that every patient ends up sort of in the refractive box within a quarter uh, or, you know, we talk about a half diopter, but realistically they're talking about within a quarter diopter. And, you know, when you think about it, you say, well, what's the value of that? When you think as a cataract surgeon about your patients who are truly like thrilled, who are knock it out of the park thrilled, it's those who are bang on plano sphere or, you know, a quarter diopter of sill or something that's, you know, small that is their residual refractive error. If you can deliver that, you've got a consistently very happy patient. So um, there's definitely a place for this lens. You're right. It's probably not for every practice, mm -hmm. but those who are really focused on success with refractive outcomes, uh, I, I don't see how you can not do it. For sure. For sure. And I, um, I, you know, I also, you know, I think that there's more to come. And I think what I love about that team particularly is their ability to kind of pivot and just keep going. And part of that's, I think one of our, our, probably mutual passions is the ability to keep evolving. And I, I think delivering better, better outcomes for our patients. And that's why I do venture. I know that's why you do venture. Um, so there's a lot of things we could talk about, right? Um, but I really want to talk about one thing that I like to pass on to others like you are. And that is how do you become, if I'm like 18, and I actually have a couple of interns in my office, how do I become the next John Hovenesian? Tell me, tell me some salient points that would give me <laughs> ability because well, I get like asked this question I said go you know I'm like go follow John I don't I mean go follow my other buddies and they're like how do I you know and and it, it's amazing that there's a secret there's a there's a sauce there's a there's a recipe in my opinion um but I want to hear from you um how do you um how do you develop leaders or future leaders in in ophthalmology specifically and what are some things that you're um, wanting the audience to know? You know, my fellowship mentor was Robert Maloney, who's uh, just one of the smartest guys that I've ever met and a brilliant surgeon and continues to teach me a lot. Um, and he taught me early in my fellowship that the, the order most of us think uh, of life or professional life is uh, uh, do, have, be. Uh, but in order, but the real order should be be, have, and do, all right? Mm -hmm. And so let me explain. Uh, you know, so do, have, and be means, you know, we think that we have to do a ton of surgery in order to have the resources, in order to become, to be the, you know, the big shot guy. But in reality, that's, uh, nobody has that. Uh, it, it, that. That path is not, is too long to be what we want to be. Uh, if you instead start and say you are what you aspire to be and you play that role, and I don't mean putting on airs, nobody likes folks who put on airs, but if you want to be a, a well-respected person, then act like somebody who's a well-respected person in your field. Uh, and then you will have, uh, you will, you'll end up doing those acts that are, you know, that kind of get you to that place and you will have the life and the practice and the resources, the money that you always sought. It will find its way to you. And uh, I thought that was just a terrific, concise way to, right. to, uh, to you know, to describe it. Um, probably more than anything, I've learned and, and glad that I adopted early the idea that relationships matter more than anything. And so uh, treat people right. Do what you say you'll do. You know, deliver on promises. Don't, don't uh, say things you don't mean or promise things you won't. 
I have no intention of delivering and, uh, and enjoy life every little bit, laugh a lot because there's, uh, um, you know, you get to do this once and there's absolutely not a shred of evidence uh, that life is serious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, for those of you listening, I mean, you know, that's people, he just culminated like 10 probably uh, of the best books written on, on success. And I think for those of us who read a lot, basically, um, to me, also the definition of success is also the give, uh, right? So all the things that you've described um, in, in addition to giving, and I think you, the more you give of yourself, um, the, the better your life will become. It's from probably the most selfish thing you can do. Um, we can spend a lot of time talking. I just, it's just been so much fun to get you on here. And uh, I know how busy you are. Um, and maybe um, I'd love to update you again sometime in the future, love my audience on, on this. And thanks. What you're doing here with uh, this OIS podcast is just terrific. Um, the, uh, the, I subscribe and listen. And it's just been so insightful to hear not just about the companies that are, the people are involved in, but the people themselves, because we're very privileged to have an outstanding group of leaders in ophthalmology. And I'm just honored to be interviewed by you, Hassan. So thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And I'll see you soon, my friend. Be safe out there. Stay well. Thanks. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to register for the OIS Virtual Public Company Showcase on July 16th. Visit OIS.net and sign up today.